Thank you very much for inviting me for this TED Talk at this great institution, Bits Pilani. It is not very often that one gets to talk to such a huge crowd of brilliant minds. Thank you very much. This is my father. Whenever I start a talk, I always show a picture of my father because I come from a very small village and until the age of 16, my father was perhaps my only teacher. I was in Pedne Keri, Mandre, with small schools. Some of the schools just stopped six months just into the year. And then my father basically uh, taught me. I went to a Marathi medium school. He taught me English. And when I finished my, uh, uh, the board examination, in spite of this, I was seventh in the board. So I basically owe a lot to my father who taught me painting, who taught me English, and he taught me many more things, and he gave me many things which he had, and he also gave me things which he did not have. When he passed away eight years ago, I made 500 portraits of my father, and I planted them to all the places where we walked. We walked on the seaside, we walked on the river, we walked on the hills. There was a favorite bunion tree where we used to go very, very often. So this was an installation which I did in memory of my father. As I told you, I was seventh in the board. And at the age of 18, like most young people, I did not know what I wanted to be. And actually, at the age of 18, I wanted to be everybody except perhaps a soldier, a priest, and a criminal. I never thought I will take art as a profession. My father was a painter, but he could not make a living out of art. So art is always my hobby. And then there was an accident of becoming a doctor. Nobody forced me to become a doctor, but I became a doctor, started a hospital in Kalangut. Ran, the hospital ran very well. Suddenly, there was a big boom in tourism industry. And almost 80% of my patients, when I was running the hospital, were British tourists. And the only disease they were suffering from, usually, was dysentery. So the idea of spending my lifetime treating British dysentery was horrible. I said, India as a country has taken enough shit from the British for 150 years, and I didn't want to take any more. <laughs> well, jokes apart, I decided that, well, this was too routine for my taste, uh, routine medicine. And so my calling was art. And I, perhaps, I gave up the most established profession to pursue the most unestablished and risky profession in the world, art. And for the last 25 years, I have been pursuing art. I started basically as a watercolor painter. Uh, these are some of my watercolors. I used to paint watercolors sitting on the roadside. And my patients, when I, they, they saw that, that this doctor, what has gone wrong with him? He has a very good practice and sits on the roadside and does water, watercolors. Uh, well, these watercolors were selling very well. But then the same thing which I had as a doctor came back again. I thought this was also routine. Where is art? Because this was basically technique. And I could do a watercolor within just about half an hour. And again, the same feeling which I had as a doctor uh, came back. And I said, this is routine. And this is not art. This is technique. And then I had opportunity to travel abroad. I went to Europe. I had opportunities to visit museums, modern art museums of the world. And when I looked at the works in the modern art museums, I understood nothing. I thought either I'm a fool or they're taking me for a ride because my father, being a realist painter, had brought me up, uh, basically teaching me that all modern art is nonsense. But then I decided I'm a fool and the journey began. And I started basically reading books, meeting artists, looking at works of art, and then a great Pandora's box has opened up to me. And that's what I have been doing for the last 25 years, practicing something which I call conceptual art, installation art. This was my first installation. And this was almost accidental. Those days, I used to do some receptions of hotels and things like this. And I had done a one meter diameter disc in copper as a lamp for a reception of a hotel. I don't know what came over me. I just went uh, to the beach with this disc, made a big crater in the sand, had an electrical wire stretched from a beach shack, and put this disc on the top of it with the lights underneath it. And this is what happened. And I was myself surprised. So this was the first installation which I did, and it was accidental. But later on, basically, I started uh, 
creating works which had a lot of political, historical, and many other kind of sociological meanings. The sea, my friend. I used to walk with my father every day on the beach from the age of 6 to 16, and the ocean, uh, sort of I developed a very special relationship with the ocean, and I started exploring ocean uh, in all its aspects. And I realized that life itself originated in the ocean, and the ocean has been a witness to the story of human civilization. Oceans actually separate the continents, but the oceans also unite the continents. The oceans are, in a way, couriers of culture. The oceans are, in a way, media for the cultural diffusions, intercontinental cultural diffusions. So I started exploring oceans. I started creating my installations on the beach. And one of my first installations was celebrating oceans medium of intercontinental cultural diffusions. This is called the moon and the tides. I collected shells on Goa Vella Beach, which is not too far from here. And I created a five and a half meters diameter circle, which was my moon. And then I waited for the tide to come and cover my moon. So the creator of the tide is covered by the tide. So this was my first installation, one of the first land art installations which I did. Uh, I have been planting shells ever since. And when my patients saw me planting shells on the beach, they thought, I mean, the doctor has gone completely mad now. That's because an idea of an adult planting shells on the beach as a profession was unheard of. But luckily for me, I sent these installations to many competitions worldwide, and the Busan Biennale selected this, and I got an award of a few lakhs rupees for this installation. This is a seahorse. This is an interesting installation because about 50% of Goa's revenue uh, until uh, 16th, 17th century came from the Arabian horses. So this is in memory of the horse trade. These are my works again with shells. And why do I do this? Do I do this just because it looks beautiful? Because when you plant mussel shells, it looks very brilliant. And when you walk around it, it's even more interesting because it's like a silk carpet and it keeps changing. See, there are many things happening when I do an installation with mussel shells. Here, my inspiration is the ocean. My theme is the ocean. My medium is given to me by the ocean. And my canvas is also the ocean. So there is a wonderful confluence of the inspiration, the theme, the medium, and the canvas. I started exploring the navigational history. I have traveled to Lothar some time back. Lothar is, is the extension of the Harappan civilization. And you will be surprised to know that we had a very active trade uh, between Arabia and India right from 3000 BC. And uh, there, are, there are ports which were used during this time. And I was invited in Dubai for the Dubai Art Fair to create a work next to the Burj Arab. And it was a very daunting task because to do a work of art next to the Burj was, uh, I mean, uh, it was a big competition. And luckily for me, I decided to create works with old boats. So I buy old boats from the fishermen here and then use those boats as a material for my sculptures. So when I use an old boat, there are things happening here. The story of the boat, the, the songs of the fishermen, the lines of the nets being pulled into the boat, the fish being pulled into the boat, all that is incorporated in this boat because it's about a 100 years old boat. And so in a way, I am using the history of the boat as a medium of my sculpture. So these are my sculptures created with boats from Goa, which I showed in Dubai. Sometimes I use glass inside the boat. When I use glass inside the boat, there's a very interesting thing happening. Because the glass, when lit, appears like water. So the boat is kind of remembering the water. It's kind of a mnemonic device. And then the glass is made out of sand. So when I keep this sculpture on the sand, the glass is sort of finding its own ancestry, remembering the sand. So these are my mnemonic devices. I use copper. I make copper waves inside the boat to basically depict water. Uh, this is a work which was recently done, which is shown at the Kochi Muzuris Biennale. Here, there are three components of this sculpture. The, the boat is from Trivendram. And as you know, it's called Katamaram. Katamaran, it's an international word now, but Katamaram is a Malayali word. Maram means wood, and keta is to tie. And this katamaran is from Trivendram. The head is a Maui head from the eastern island. 
and then there is a bubble gum. So this sculpture, in a, uh, in a satirical way, traces the evolution of human civilization from the Incan civilization to the bubblegum civilization. Pepper Cross is one of my works, the title work of an exhibition I recently had in Amsterdam. Now, India would not have been colonized if there was no pepper here. Basically, the colonial powers came here to control the pepper trade, which was earlier with the Arab merchants. Pepper is to be taken from uh, India to the Red Sea, uh, to a port in, the, uh, in Egypt, and then through caravans to the Nile, and from the Niles it was taken to Alexandria, and the Venetian ships came to Alexandria to take pepper to the rest of Europe. And the Portuguese wanted to control this trade, so they couldn't do it on land because they had to defeat the Egyptians, the Arab, I mean, there's so many people to control that trade, so that's how alternate route was found. And pepper was so expensive in Europe that it was about 300 times more expensive than what it was available here in India. And pepper was called black gold. I mean, a few months ago, I was in Switzerland on a train from uh, Basel to Zurich, and I met an old professor, and he told me that even today, in German language, somebody who shows off his wealth has a bad word. He's called pepper sack. Pepper sack means, okay, kya samishta hai ko? I mean, since he's too rich, he's too big. So that word is still used. And there are records. In 1312, there was a war in, in Rome. And the ransom asked was three tons of pepper. So pepper was so very important. And so I created this sculpture with a hull of a 100 years old boat and the oars. And if you see the details, there are kind of dots like pepper on this um, sculpture. So this is a work called Pepper Cross. Not many of you will be aware that chilies are not from India. Can you imagine Indian food without chilies? Chilies arrived in India in Goa in 1545. So if there has to be a gateway of chilies in India, it has to be in Goa. Actually, not just chilies, that many other food items arrived uh, through the colonial powers. Portuguese brought chilies from Brazil. There is no mention of chilies in the Vedas. In Upanishads, there is no mention of chilies. Kautilya's Arthashastra, which was written in second century BC, there, are, there is mention of many different recipes. Uh, in Arthashastra book, uh, you don't expect to find recipes, but there are recipes, and all these uh, food items are cooked with pepper. Uh, in Aine Akbari, which is a 16th century book about the food cooked in Akbar's cuisine, all the dishes are cooked with pepper. There is no mention of chili. The first mention of chili in Indian written word is in a poem written by a saint poet from Karnataka, from Hampi, called Purandar Dasa. Purandar Dasa wrote this poem somewhere in 1545, and the poem is lovely. He says, oh chili, I have seen you turn red from green. You have made my food so tasty and delicious that when I eat you, O chili, I even forget to utter the name of Vittala. So that was a praise of, in praise of chili, a poem written by a saint poet Purandar Dasa. Chilies really spread like wildfire. Chilies are the most important component of Indian food, and we are the largest producers of chilies in the world. I had an opportunity to travel all around the chili producing places in the country and have made many sculptures of chilies and these sculptures are essentially made with uh, used truck tires. So I'm going to, uh, uh, they are right now also exhibited in Kochi Biennale. These are my sculptures of the chilies. And you'll be surprised, uh, in the lipstick, there is some pigment which is used for making it red. It's the oleo resin and it comes from chilies. That why it explains that, uh, okay, you say a girl is hot when she uses lipsticks. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> Russian beauty obliged me with one of my sculptures. Well, I very often, political artist, I very often use history, politics in my work. Uh, I'm a supporter of the Tibetan cause. I have traveled very often to the Himalayas, tracked in Himalayas, and what fascinated me in Himalayas was the the Tibetan flags. There are thousands of these lungtas on the slopes of Himalayas. And uh, lungta means the wind horse in Tibetan. And the Tibetans believe 
that with the wind, the prayers will be answered with the speed of the horse. So there are thousands of these flags and the sound which these flags create with the wind is amazing. It's like a cosmic sound. And I have never seen these uh, flags on the seaside, only on the hillsides, only in the Himalayas. And there are more than 300 Tibetan people in Goa. They come here to uh, sell goods to the tourists. And I have a soft corner to these people. Uh, they virtually sit there. They never sort of hack, uh, I mean, like, unlike many other vendors, they just sit quiet there like Tukaramas and don't really go behind the customers. And I, have a, I decided to do something uh, in support of the Tibetan cause on the seaside. And luckily for me, I was uh, put in charge of uh, last to escort His Holiness Dalai Lama when he visited uh, uh, Goa. And I spoke about this idea to His Holiness, and he liked the idea, so he instructed his supporters to uh, help me with my project. And then I had one kilometer of lungtas, about 600 Tibetan flags which came down from the hill of Wagator. And it was about one kilometer of line, and I call it unfolding of a dream. And this was an oceanic prayer for the snow, for the freedom of the snow. Tibet is in the, supposed to be the roof of the world, but unfortunately, the Tibetans don't have a roof of own, own heads. And so this was an oceanic prayer, the ocean praying for the freedom of the snow. So that we even had about 300 uh, Tibetans with mashals and prayers uh, basically marching past my installation. And each of this flag was lit, and at night, this is how it looked like. So this was my work in support of the Tibetan cause. I was invited uh, last year to Portugal. So I decided to take a kind of a poetic revenge on the Portuguese. Since they changed the food habit of India, I decided that I will do something to take a kind of a poetic revenge. I took rice from Goa and planted it in the Lisbon in the garden in the shape of the root of Vasco da Gama. So when the rice grew, it just didn't grow rice, it grew history. Well. I am very passionate about my work. Art is not just my profession, it is my passion. And I basically believe that only if you do things which you're passionate about, there is a possibility of success and happiness. If you do something which you don't like, I can ensure you, you are bound to be a failure and unhappy. And I basically believe that to be happy is the purpose of our life. To sum up my work, I will resort to a poem by Tagore. He says, when death knocks on your door, and says, your time has come. When death knocks on my door and says, your time has come, I shall tell death, I never lived in time, I lived in love. And when death asks me, will your works be remembered forever? I shall tell death, I do not know. But when I created these works, I felt eternity. Thank you.